go ahead and call this meeting to order. <clears throat> we'll start off the meeting with a moment of silent reflection, followed by an invocation by Chaplain Lutroff with the Indian River County Jail and the Pledge of Allegiance by Commissioner Bob Solari. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. Father, we continue to lift up in prayer the men and women in the armed forces who sacrificed their lives for this country. We, we thank you for giving them that calling, and we ask that you continue to guide and protect them as they serve. Lord, we lift up this meeting. And Father, your word says that you appoint every government official, and today as we stand here, we know these men and women on the county commission have an agenda here as they do um, each week and each month. And we ask as they go by each item that you would give them the wisdom. Father, we thank you for the county commissioners. We thank you for um, appointing them to lead this great city we live in. Indian River County is one of the most beautiful and appealing cities probably in the country. And we know that they take their duty seriously. And we ask that today not only do they um, have the wisdom to deal with each item, that in the years ahead that you would impart the wisdom of Solomon, the leadership of David, and the compassion of Jesus as they continue to guide this great city we're in. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Approval. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Flesher and a second by Commissioner Zork. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Our next item will be a presentation of proclamation <coughs> recognizing Ms. Ashma Wild for her outstanding support to the Indian River County Solid Waste Disposal District. Would you like to come on up? Madam Chair, thank you for the uh, opportunity and privilege to uh, present this proclamation. Um, and many of you know I've, I've had a, a long relationship with CURB, a uh, good 15 years. And, uh, well, in the room, and we could talk about who, who was the original Garvey or how it all began. And we see a whole room of legacy here. There's a lot of Kirbians in the room. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're thankful because it does take a, a village to run a curb. And uh, one of those individuals um, is here today and that's Miss Ashma Wild, and uh, we take this time to say thank you. Thank you. It's been a privilege and an honor of working with uh, Ashma, and she has uh, most certainly brought the A game to the table and uh, a lot of resources and energy that would otherwise not be there. So thank you. I'll proceed with the uh, proclamation. Uh, recognizing Ashma Wild for her outstanding support to the Indian River County Solid Waste Disposal District. Whereas one of the important goals of Indian River County is to provide a safe, attractive, and well-managed natural environment for all the citizens and guests. And whereas the Solid Waste Disposal District recognizes Keep Indian River Beautiful as a nonprofit community organization and dedicated partner supporting the environmental goals of Indian River County. And whereas Ashima Wild of Republic Services of Florida has served as the president of Keep Indian River Beautiful for the past 10 years. Whereas Ms. Wild has provided exemplary support to the Solid Waste Disposal District and advancing environmental education and waste reduction efforts for the residents of any River County. Whereas Ms. Wild has uh, spearheaded count, uh, countless community projects, such as the International Coastal Cleanup, the Great American Cleanup, and the Paddle Dash. 
as well as various beach and lagoon cleanup efforts and an event recycling I uh, initiatives. Whereas the county and the board of the Solid Waste Disposal District wish to thank Ms. Weil for her leadership and inexhaustible dedication in keeping Indian River County beautiful. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the board recognizes Ashima Weil's outstanding efforts in support of the Indian River County Solid Waste Disposal District and our residents express its sincere gratitude for a full decade of skilled leadership and an abundant hard, hard work and look forward to her continued service to our community in whatever direction her many talents take her. Duly adopted this 10th day of December 2019, signed by all five county commissioners. I feel important. <laughs> <laughs> You are. <laughs> well, uh, it's up to you. Customarily, we ask everyone that's here to, uh, uh, yeah, please don't leave, Ashima. <laughs> yeah, uh, she, she started going for the door. Uh, but uh, normally when, when people come to uh, wish you well in, in a proclamation, uh, there's just a couple. Uh, I see there's quite a gaggle, so uh, it's up to you if you want everybody to stand by the microphone or we, we I see we have Jim Jim here to lead it off. Thank Ma you. Ma'am Chair, uh, good morning, Com fellow commissioners and staff and many guests who are here today. I thank you for sharing in the opportunity to recognize Ashma Wild's contributions to the area throughout these many years. As it relates to Keep Indian River Beautiful, you know, she has been a, board, a, a member of our board for some 15 years, about as long as the organization has existed, as I recall. She's been chair of the organization for 10, for 10 years, and she's contributed much to all of us. I mean, she, she's an executive for uh, the Re Republic Waste System. She's obviously <laughs> distinguished herself there. She's known to her community uh, by many, both in the individual and private waste sectors in our, in, uh, of our community. She's been involved in our CURB board and done a great deal on behalf of CURB. She's offered guidance. She's offered support with her business and community co contacts. It's been very good for grants that we've had the opportunity to secure, sponsorships that we have enjoyed. Meanwhile, she's busy getting her hands dirty, helping get solid waste devices there for our receptacles and uh, picking up straws out of the sand. So uh, I think she's been very involved in CURB. I think everybody in our board and many of them if each of you would stand and just, just to recognize your presence here today, there's about 10 members of our board. As you pointed out, it is a nonprofit organization, but uh, we work on behalf of the county and so many others, to, and we're pleased to serve, to beautify Indian River County, one of our many functions. Thank you. Daisy, would you please? Um, we have a, a letter for Ashma that we just wanted to read to you so that way you guys fully, everyone fully understands her contribution to our organization and to every resident of the county and the things that she's helped um, the organization accomplish over the years. Um, so I'm just going to read the letter. Um, they keep in your river beautiful board all wanted to express our gratitude and appreciation for years of dedicated, passionate service to keep Indian River beautiful, our mission and our community. Ashma is an exemplary leader and organization. The organization would have been lost without her guidance over the past 10 years. During her tenure as president, Keep Any River Beautiful accomplished many great things. For example, we completed over 1,500 projects, worked with over 20,000 volunteers, cleaned more than 200,000 pounds of litter, planted 1,000 trees, and diverted nearly 500,000 pounds of recycling from the landfill. We have added new programs like Lagoon Friendly Lawns, Paddle Dash, Cigarette Litter Prevention Program, and America Recycles Day to our community. She has tenaciously held the organization together through numerous staff and board changes ensuring our future. Her, her vision has brought us all together to take up the cause and hopefully ease the burden of sustaining the organization by herself over these past years. She is without a doubt always loved, admired, and respected by us all and we thank her for everything she has done. We hope to continue growing the organization and improving the community together with her in the future. I'd like 
Mrs. Comment, Madam Chair, that uh, Ashima is joined today by others. She has neighbors, she has friends, she has business. Can I ask them to rise? They're really here today to also it makes support me feel like with I'm us. Getting an Oscar. I know the, <laughs> the whole <laughs> the whole room is, is here today to thank to thank you. Yeah. Ashma, you have a comment? I think uh, Joanne wants yeah, to say I something. Yeah, I want to say something. Real I want quick. to say a shout out to my husband. Who's yeah. 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 Good morning. Yes. Good morning, Joanne Stanley, Republic yeah. Services. We just are so honored that that you guys uh, have done this for Ashima. Ashima is an exemplary employee for Republic Services, as you all know. She's the face of Republic here in Indian River County. She has worked tirelessly for the county, and she really cares about the residents and what goes on in the county. Just so you know, last year she also won the Employee of the Year Award for, um, for Republic Services. So we want to honor youth, and thank you so much for all of your efforts. Freddie wanted to come up and say something on behalf of Ashima. Also, the Gifford community have cleanup days, and uh, Ashima is a part of uh, everything we do. We call her when we need uh, bins or whatever. She's always helped us. We can call her on the phone, say, <laughs> We can call her at any time, and she would always come to our rescue. And we, we want her to know that we do thank her also for all she did for the Gifford community also. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. Hamachu. Come on down, Hamachu. Real quick, uh, Himan Shumet, the Managing Director for Solid Waste, and on behalf of the Solid Waste District, uh, we want to thank Ashma for a great job with Curb and everything she does for, for the community. next item let's see we don't have any minutes or informational items so I'll move on to the consent agenda does anybody want to pull anything from the consent agenda yes madam chair I'd like to move uh, item 8 J J yes all right anything else anybody from the public wish to pull anything from the consent agenda move to madam approve chair. consent as amended second I have a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, and we'll move on to 8J. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I am in support of staff's recommendation to reject the bids, but um, I didn't get to finish up all the discussion items I had with Jason and Rich yesterday, so uh, if you could bear with me for a minute. When this piece was originally purchased, didn't we surrender this to DOT as part of the cure plan for the parcels to the north and to the south at one time? I know part of the parcels north of the restaurant location, I think that we secured, became part of the cure plan for the mobile gas station on the corner. And does DOT no longer need this as part of their cure workout or has everybody been settled? Right. I, I, th I think it was initially contemplated as part of the cure plan for, say, parking for Szechuan Palace. Um, that didn't end up working out. Uh, DOT ended up acquiring the whole Szechuan Palace parcel. They are going to, uh, they're in the process of sell surplusing that, um, and there may be an opportunity down the road um, f to, to, to look at selling, selling this property again. There may be some value to the eventual owner of the Szechuan Palace parcel also of the uh, Cumberland Farms to the south, which was initially thought to be part of the cure plan okay. potentially as well, but uh, that that didn't work out and what, what uh, DOT ended up acquiring the entire Szechuan Palace. Okay. okay. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> uh, with that explanation, I'll move staff recommendation to reject the, the bids received. Second. In some discussion, Madam Chair. Yes, under discussion. Commissioner. Thank you. Um, and commissioners, I think I talked to Jason about this yesterday, but um, for commercial pieces of property, maybe other parcels of land and, and such, 
we might want to consider going to some type of commercial realtor to market these that might have a much more broader network of people looking for commercial uh, zone property. And my understanding is, um, Dylan, we would go through like a request for qualifications process and then maybe pick the top three and then we would just rotate through that, you know, as pieces come up or kind of like what we do with engineers and such. We have a, a ro rotating list, yeah. So the first thing we would have to do is under the uh, Florida statutes is we'd have to, I'd have to get an authorization from the board uh, to enact uh, an ordinance to or to draft an ordinance and have it approved by the board, which would authorize the county to then take those types of measures. So that would be the first step. So if it's the board's uh, wish uh, to kind of broaden the horizon of the way by which we uh, dispose of uh, surplus property, um, I'd be happy to follow that direction and, and work on that. Okay. I'll Wait till after the vote, then maybe see what the board feels on that subject. Okay. And Madam Chair, under, well, I'll, if he's going to bring it up after, I'll add discussion to it separately from, from now. Okay. Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay. So we have a motion by Commissioner Zorick and a second by Commissioner Flesher on 8J. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And Commissioner O'Brien? I guess, Madam Chair, I'd just like to ask the board if they did want to, you know, consider having Dylan pursue a change in the ordinance to allow us to utilize uh, commercial realtors for parcels like this. And I guess Commissioner Zork has some discussion. Right. I think um, I don't remember the timeline, but I had brought this up one time before and there was did not seem to be consensus at that time to modify the ordinance. I think it's a smart move to maximize uh, county assets that we're disposing of. So. If the mood has shifted, I would be in favor of. of well, uh, I, doing I guess it. I can make the motion and you'll second it, and then right. we'll see if we can get to three or not. <laughs> so, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion. We instruct the county attorney to bring back a proposed ordinance change that would allow us to use, utilize commercial realtors um, for disposing of surplus property. Second. Okay. We Does that cover it, Dylan? That, that's direction I need. Fair enough. Okay. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, a second by Commissioner Zork. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll move on to constitutional officers. A presentation by Mr. Smith, the Indian River County Clerk of Court, on a fantastic award that they have won. Another one. Thank you, Madam Chair. My, Jeff Smith, Clerk of the Court and Comptroller. <clears throat> I'm proud today to present to you um, two awards. Uh, one is the 36th year in a row that we've got the award for the CAFR, the, Con the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for 2018. And then the second one is the fourth year in a row out of four years that we've got the Popular Annual Financial Report Award from Governor F Government Finance Officers Association. I'd like to introduce my staff, um, <coughs> my finance director, Alyssa Nagy, my senior accountant, Rayanne Cohn, my staff accountant, Michelle King, and now Adams, I'm sorry, <laughs> and uh, my HR director who does a lot of the, um, di the formatting for the PAFR, uh, Laura McGiver, and my internal auditor, Ed Halsey. Without them and without the board staff, we wouldn't be able to do this, so I wanted to present them to you. Congratulations. Well deserved, Jeff. And, and you know, I love that popular report. It's, it's a great thing to hand out to people, and it's real easy to understand. It gives them a really good snapshot of what we're doing. So that's an awesome publication, and the awards are well deserved. Congratulations, and all your staff as well. Most definitely. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm just concerned uh, for uh, Jeff Smith, uh, as uh, as again, we're we're not uh, we're confronted sometimes with budget amendments for. Uh, spatial needs, and uh, he's going to need a bigger wall. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Rich. <laughs> oh, oh, Rich is still in a room? Well, they've gone to this thing where they give us buttons now for each year instead of an actual plaque. So and that's in respect to high achievers like? 36 years <laughs> worth of. Yeah. Youth yeah. Well, congratulations to you guys. Guess Florida what, yesterday. team? <laughs> you guys did it all, too. Congratulations to y'all.
Look how nice Jeff looks now with this team. Yeah, better. <laughs> you need a little platform. I do. I need a little stool. <laughs> <laughs> Put one of the tall ones in front of you. Uh, yes. If I may follow up on Commissioner O'Brien's statement, you know, I'm on these monthly Florida Association of County Attorneys calls where we talk about major legal issues that are affecting county attorneys across the state. And I can tell you consistently there's at least one county attorney who's got a problem with the sheriff or the problem with the clerk and they're fighting amongst each other. I just have to say I, I have enjoyed such an amazing relationship with Jeff and your whole team. And I just want to thank Jeff for, for just the way that he conducts his office and, and works with us. So I just want to thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to public items. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing on bio, a biosolids moratorium extension ordinance. Thank you very much. Um, due to the algal bloom issues that we experienced at uh, Blue Cypress Lake uh, in the summer of 2018, the Board of County Commissioners had adopted uh, a six month uh, moratorium on the land application of bio Class B biosolids in the unincorporated areas of Indian River County. That moratorium has since been extended and is in, will be in place until January 7th, 2020. Uh, since the moratorium is set to expire, the county attorney's office had drafted this ordinance, extending the moratorium for another six months so that it'll go into place through July of 2020. Uh, with that, simply just recommend that the board open up the public hearing, take public comments, and adopt the ordinance as presented. And with that, I am available for any additional questions. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions at this time? Just, Dylan, what's the status now of the DEP rulemaking? How much more time do we have before that gets? So I know there will be a uh, public hearing, which I believe is in front of the ERC, I believe it is. Um, they had a meeting, I think, scheduled in December, but I believe it's been canceled. So the next meeting is not scheduled for until I think it's January 29th. Um, so at this point, uh, they've drafted their rule. It's been distributed. We've made comments. Other uh, folks have made comments, and we are waiting for the uh, that hearing. And Jason, if you have any additional information, and, and and I'll add, you know, the the legislative session is fast approaching. I know the 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 new rule that DEP has been working on would require ratification by the legislature. So I think their target is to have the rule enacted in time to have that ratification by the legislature in the 2020 session. So I, I think that's the timeline that they're working on. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right, at this time, I'll open the public hearing. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item, please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Uh, Joseph Palin, uh, president of Black Swan Consulting, 6450 six, Tropical Way. Uh, this is one of the first times, or one of the few times I actually support a moratorium <laughs> but I support the recommendation to extend the moratorium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Good morning, commissioners. My name is Russell Herman. I reside at 586 Redwood Court, Sebastian. I'm here today representing the Friends of St. Sebastian River in 2016, the Indian River Lagoon economic value was $7 billion, $600 million. Biosolids runoff are being deposited where they are able to mitigate into the St. Sebastian River and ultimately into the Indian River Lagoon, significantly contributing to eutrophication. The detrimental effects are often largely out of sight. Hidden below our water's surface, the results enhance destruction. Algae blooms block sunlight, which is needed to sustain life. Sunlight is essential to sustain the health and beauty of life in our rivers and estuaries. Algae, in the right amount, is very much needed and natural, of course. But algae is an aggressive growth competitor. 
biosolids contribute significantly to giving algae an upper hand because it doesn't need to be rooted to the riverbed or the lagoon bottom like grasses do. Algae thrives freely, unrooted, often suspended in the water column of the attached grass. Compare eutrophication to laying plywood over a lush green residential lawn. What lies under the plank deprives of sunlight, no photosynthesis, eventually dies, taking every living thing dependent on it out of the picture. Indian River County Utilities Department takes its own dewatershed biosolids to the landfill. IRC does not spread dewatered waste on land within the county. Remember that $7,600,000,000 is the lagoon's economic value. Do you want to gamble and possibly lose that value? Please continue biosolids ban in our county. Stop the destructive trickle of this product in our waters. It is a significant step to cleaning up our waters, and it is the right thing to do. Thank you for your consideration of this very important matter. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Thank you, Peggy. Anybody else from the public? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Any further, I'll move the extension of the biosolids moratorium ordinance. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Solari and a second by Commissioner Flesher. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. Our next item is a public hearing on GYAC limited alcohol consumption ordinance. Thank you very much. Uh, on uh, November 19th, uh, representatives from the Gifford Youth Achievement Center came to the board requesting the ability to serve alcohol at the GYAC facility. Uh, based upon the direction provided uh, by the board at that meeting, the county attorney's office has drafted an amendment to the ordinance and also an amendment to the lease, which will allow for the service of alcohol at GYAC under the following conditions. Uh, GYAC is to employ a licensed caterer uh, to serve the alcohol. GYAC has to have the necessary security plans in place. GYAC has to have the appropriate insurance in place. Um, and then service can only occur after 6 p.m. No children can be present. There will be no quote unquote sale of alcohol at the event. Um, and then finally, there will be no ability to assign it. They won't be able to rent it out to other folks. Um, simply County Attorney's Office recommends that we open up the public hearing, take any public comment, and then approve the ordinance and the lease. I just wanna thank the representatives of GYAC and um, the Parks and Recreation staff who worked very quickly on getting this all put back together so we could bring this back to the board in December because I know the, the folks at GYAC were looking forward to getting an event going for I think February, so I was just really happy to work with all the different parties to make sure we could get this uh, put together effectively and quickly, so thank you all. Thank you, commissioners. Any um, questions or comments of staff at this time? None. Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item, please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Good morning. Good morning. Freddie Wolfhawk, 4590 57th Avenue, Rural Beach, Florida. I just want to say a big thank you. Thank you so very much to the staff and commissioners and attorneys, everyone who had a part in bringing this fruition so quickly. It affords us an opportunity once again to have individuals to come over to the GYAC and we're not asking them for anything but we're giving them something that's thank you, a big thank you. So it gives us that atmosphere and Peggy can't wait and she's back there now planning right now some nice thank you events for our donors and supporters. So again, thank you so very much. We are a great team, we work well together and we wanna continue that type of relationship in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Madam Chair, which is, mm -hmm. uh, for Freddie, I, I, I just want to say that uh, you may say thank, thank you for our swiftness, but it, it's kind of easy when you have good stewards like yourself and your team that have time and time again responded in, in the most favorable uh, light and conditions 
to ensure that your mission at hand was taken very seriously and uh, with great respect and, and dedication to excellence. So it's, it's kind of easy when you have a team like you have. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Is that a staff recommendation? Second. I have a motion by Commissioner O'Brien, a second by Commissioner Flesher. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck with your event. The next item is a public discussion item, a request to speak from Mr. Jason Yergler regarding the intersection of 66th Avenue and 8th Street. Welcome. My name is Jason Yergler. I'm at uh, 6425 5th Street in uh, Vero Beach. Um, <clears throat> and I'm a little bit disarmed. I came uh, up until yesterday prepared to uh, uh, make a pretty uh, serious case, but that has been obviated. Uh, the, I'm not sure if we all, uh, you're all familiar with the intersection of 8th Street and 66th Avenue. It is a particularly dangerous intersection. Um, and for quite some time, we have advocated uh, for a, a traffic light. Uh, they put up a stop sign, um, blinking light, and accidents have continued, including a, con a county truck that was just involved in one couple weeks ago. So uh, Mr. Zork informs me that that has now been done. There will be a traffic light put in uh, at that intersection. So instead of coming and arguing my case, um, that has now been obviated. I wanted to really comment on the performance of multiple government agencies. Uh, I spoke to the Sheriff's Department and they were extremely helpful in getting me statistics for accidents at that intersection and multiple, and multiple other intersections. Uh, the Public Works Department for getting me information on traffic flow data. Um, the State Department of Transportation was eh, not as helpful, but the... Um, <laughs> it happened. Wait, wait, let, let's put our surprise faces on. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know, I know, right? But, uh, but I put in an information request to the Sheriff's Department. They called me that afternoon and got me the information within another, uh, the, the next morning, I believe. Mm. Public Works Department, I called them, uh, and I stopped by, and uh, they, uh, they got me the information I needed the next day, and, um, and a couple of their people spent a good 20, 30 minutes with me on the phone going over the information that because I didn't understand some of the acronyms and they were very patient, very helpful. So, uh, so thanks to the board, thanks to the, the, the county offices that I dealt with. Um, now, we still do need a done by date and that will be something that we, we pursue uh, to, to ensure that that is, uh, that is done on time. Um, because if it had gone much farther, someone would have died at that intersection. So I guess I came expecting, you know, oh, let me prove my case and show this and drop the mic, aha. And uh, I just have to, sh I know my community, Pine Tree Park, um, we had a bunch of people who were gonna show up here. I have several letters from people in the community that I told them here, if I can't be there, let me bring your letter to show them. And uh, I've still even got a couple members of the, the neighborhood here now, even after it's been resolved. That's how passionate the neighborhood is. So uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Zork said that he would get me a, a, a date to be uh, expectation, uh, expectation of completion. Um, and we'll just keep an eye on that and make sure that happens. But thanks to everybody who, uh, who made that, is, is making that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yergler. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Mr. Chair. Jason. Um, before you go, Jason, just a, a couple of items. And I, we tried to get a few other backup items out to you um, yesterday. So we're currently in that, that warrant study that we had talked about yesterday that the Public Works Director mentioned, hoping to have that done um, uh, early next year, hopefully before the end of January. Then from there, the go forward, there's the design and engineering. We don't have to add turn lanes there, but there's a, about a six-month period 
for that and then the construction to follow. So um, I don't think we'll make the 930 20 that we had talked about, but it'll be well underway and in the works by yeah, then. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. I mean, that, and, and we understand the, the gears grind slowly sometimes because you have to do all those things. So that's fine. As long as we can get a, you know, September 30th, Halloween, Thanksgiving, some date that we can be, you know, oh, it should be finished, and then we'll see the, the, the work undergoing. We'll know it's, it's on its way. So. Right. And we'll certainly keep you posted as it moves through the process. Well, I'll keep, well don't worry. We'll, we'll keep ourselves posted. You know where posted. to find us. Fantastic. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh -huh. And then feel free to share. We also sent out one other thing I think didn't go out to you till this morning, but uh, uh, Ed in our office had prepared the kind of the crash history results. So there's 26 accidents at that location in the past three years, which is a pretty high number. And some of those, as you mentioned, are, are very serious. And that does not count that drops off from uh, June 10th of this year. So there's another batch that has not been added into this tally, but, and you can share that with your, your neighborhood group that you I have. Will. Yeah, the, the Sheriff's Department, I think from the date that that went, became a through street, I think they had a record of 29, not counting the, the two dump trucks, the county trucks. So that would be 30 accidents. Right. At that intersection, so 26 is- Large in number. June, yeah, it's close enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Jason. You um, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioners, just, just want to provide the timeline and, and a little bit of clarification. So we're currently working on the warrant study. That's the process that we go through to determine whether a, a traffic signal is warranted there. So we still have to go through that process, make a determination that there is. Um, so that hasn't happened yet. We're going through that process. We'll keep you in the loop on that. If the warrant study determines that the intersection is needed we have placed the funding in the budget the, do the dollars are there if it is if it is warranted that will take about 12 to 18 months um, to get the design done and and procure the materials and 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 uh, have the have the construction done i think the master arms themselves are like a nine month wait list item these days um, because they have to be all all manufactured um, custom custom for each for each intersection and there's there's just a backlog on that um, so that's where we are on that we'll keep um, everyone in the loop on on where we go what the result of the warrant study is and then the timeline going forward if, if, if it does pass the warrant test just just to make a comment on that because that's a, that's an interesting talk to the public works department and they explain there's nine there's nine separate categories of, of warrants and, and all that um, <clears throat> and they were insistent on these are consistent with national standards, which, okay, fine, I understand a lot of this funding is federal, so you can't just go outside of these things. But there are significant problems that that's the role of local government to attend to with those warrants. For example, those warrants do not take into account important factors in the in relationship to protecting the citizens of our county for instance there have to be five accidents one of the warrants is five accidents in which a traffic signal would have made a, uh, a difference in one calendar year the problem with that is by itself that doesn't take into account traffic flow that doesn't take into account um, in, instead of just a number of, of accidents, it should be a percentage of traffic flow because that, that intersection doesn't have nearly as much traffic flow as some others that have, but it has uh, more accidents. The other problem with that, and this is from the public works people, that does not take into, the, the, the number of accidents does not take, take into account the severity of the accidents. So for instance, the speeds on 66th Avenue are ridiculous. I have been passed in the turn lane, and you ask any member of our community, you'll see this. You get passed in the turn lane. If you're doing 45, which is the speed limit, you're going to be tailgated. So that 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 particular warrant does not make differentiate between an accident that just causes significant property damage and uh, serious physical injury. So, for instance. If I get run into and I just get the bumper ripped off my car this afternoon, that counts as an accident for the purpose of that warrant. The problem is it counts exactly the same as the accident between the two dump trucks in which four people got sent to the hospital and one of them only survived because of immediate intervention. 
so, and that was my, that was, you know, kind of going back on what Mr. Zork said yesterday, he basically said it was a done deal. The problem with those warrants is they don't take into account the needs of the particulars of the community. That intersection is particularly dangerous, and trust me, I can bring them. I've got the numbers to show that. But it, talking to the Public Works Department, it just, like, the line for, hey, it requires one and we can't do it, that intersection based on those numbers is like just on this side of that line. So if they do another warrant study, it's possible that it won't make it. Even though, as I asked Mr. Zork, how much is that accident last week since it county truck, county workers, how much is that gonna ca cost the county? Probably a good bit more than whatever this intersection is gonna cost. So that would be my, I'll come back, you know, if, if, if this warrant study doesn't show that it's necessary, I've got all the facts and figures to demonstrate that if you don't do something about it, you'll not be protecting the citizens of this county. And to be perfectly honest, I give a crap what the federal government says needs to be there. I know what the, county, the citizens of our county, particularly my neighborhood need, and that is some sort of intervention at that intersection. So keep an eye on that but i'll but, but if that if that warrant study shows that it's not required i'll come back and i'll demonstrate that it is required and i'll bring some voters with me too thank you mr yegler we do appreciate it and look forward to your continued involvement in yeah. this and madam chair if i may just before you go um just a warning that if even if a signal goes in it's not going to fix all the problems there no and and, 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 and uh, let me just tell you because i get this all the time in my district when people want a traffic light the people that are running in 8th Street has a stop sign warning the head sign and then we have our the biggest stop sign you can get with red lights on it the people who are still running that aren't going to get smarter just because we put a signal in okay they're still going to be distracted they're still going to be on their cell phone don't go driving through they're thinking you're protected now because you got a green light on my on my Facebook post where I told the the neighborhood group about that and I said and this is a quote from my post now the onus is on us right you still got to be sure that we're driving carefully so absolutely that's part of it uh, the traffic signal isn't a as an end-all end be-all but if there's a red light ahead maybe it'll slow some people down on it's not just the people running through the stop sign at 8th Street that's not the only problem the ridiculous speeds on 66 because now between Oslo and 60 there's no light there's nothing right. and if people see a signal ahead or a red light ahead maybe it'll slow them down on 66 so it's not you're, you're correct and I reiterated that to the community but then also maybe it'll have a, a another effect of slowing traffic down slightly on 66 so because some of the accidents are people actually stopped at 8th Street oh that guy's doing 45 he's actually doing 70 so they pull out and uh and get creamed there's a there's a couple accidents that i looked at where that's what happened mm -hmm. gotcha. you know so and no it's not a it's not a panacea absolutely not and no illusions of that just so y'all are aware yep, absolutely and, and that's a law enforcement L law enforcement should help yeah. with enforcement and of the speed limit there because talk to the sheriff's department and they said that they would pass that on to the uniform people so we're pursuing those avenues too Fantastic. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Our next item is community development, condemnation, demolition, and removal of unsafe structure located at 530 13th Place. Gentlemen, welcome. Microphone. Thank you. Again, good morning, Commissioners. Scott McAdam in your River County building official. What we have uh, in front of you today, commissioners, is one structure. It's a four unit multifamily dwelling um, that we have before you for demolition approval. Uh, the structure was inspected. The owners were all noticed uh, to repair, or remove the structure within 60 days. Uh, property maintenance code, uh, the structure was found to be unsafe, detrimental to the health, safety, and general welfare of the public. Uh, like we noted, the, um, the address is 530 13th Place, and the owner is Indian River Beach Properties, LLC. Um, 
Maria Allo is a registered agent. It's a dissolved LLC. What I have in front of you here on the uh, view is uh, Ariel. So it's located um, just east of US 1 and south of 17th Street. It's a small cul-de-sac and the building's located in the cul-de-sac with similar structures. Uh, those structures are all owned sort of differently. Um, some are owned as you know condos or apartments and this one structure is located on the north side of uh, 13th Street, uh, 13th Place, and it's the long structure just before you get to the cul-de-sac. That's 530. Um, so the structure has been open and unsecure and abandoned off and on since like 2009. At this time, it's secure uh, for the past few weeks. It's been open um, off and on for vagrants and vandals. It's completely gutted on the inside down to the bare stud walls. And while I'm speaking, I'll just you know flip through a couple of these. Um, so off and on, uh, the owners have come up and uh, boarded up windows, uh, doors. Uh, they've been busted in again. Plywood's been taken off. You can see here that it's uh, a couple pictures that it's totally gutted down to the studs. Um, Windows and doors uh, recently were installed um, without permits. Uh, the interior demo um, was done without a permit. Um, there's two code enforcement liens. Uh, they're running at $100 per day. Uh, 2014, one of them started, that's 177,000. Uh, 2016, uh, another one started, that's $105,000. There's a utility lien of just a little bit over $2,500. No back taxes. The structure was built in 1980. The land and structure at this time is valued at around $93,000. There's no mortgage. Um, as of last week, I met with Maria and Juan uh, De Los Santos, um, also part of the corporation and owners. Uh, we met Wednesday, December 4th to discuss the property, the issues, and code enforcement issues. Uh, spoke with uh, Maria yesterday, and she indicated that she'd be here to uh, talk to the county commission, and she is here. I see that she's, she made it. Um, so staff recommends um, the board declare the structure unsafe, a nuisance, and to be demolished. And staff further recommends that the board adopt the attached resolution for the purpose of recovering the county's demolition costs. And like a lot of these um, condemned structures that we bring in front of the commission, lots of times it's the 11th hour, you know, the, the couple of weeks before they get some final notices, they come in and, 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 and start meeting with us. So that's why that happened. So um, after I uh, did the staff report, we had those meetings. And just as an update, staff would be uh, open to allowing the structure to be renovated. It's a simple rectangle concrete structure, uh, new roof in about 2005 after the storms when it was damaged that caused a lot of these, this damage. Um, so the roof's in good shape, uh, now has windows and doors. Like I say, just need to catch up with some permits. But we'd uh, support that if we had a timeline. So if they got, um, plans to us and, and apply for permits within 60 days, um, got the permits and started construction within 90 days and the final completion within a year, something like that. Um, I think the structure should remain. It doesn't do any of us any good to have that as a vacant piece of property. Um, so those are our recommendations from staff. All right, thank you. Commissioner. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Scott, one, any ballpark idea of what renovating this up to you know code and everything would would cost I would say at least two hundred thousand mm. dollars it's four units so you times everything by four um, you know four bathrooms four kitchens um, they could do two at a time possibly and, and show progress and I think once people are in there and once yeah, they've the completed uh, the vandalism now is coming <coughs> from the rear of the property, so the two sides in the front is basically taken care of, an open parking lot, but the rear has been overgrown and 
very inviting for vandals to go in that area, knock down the, the plywood that's on the glass slide doors. Um, and I think that's what the, the owner will indicate that uh, yesterday, she indicated to me that she was there all day taking care of that. I have another presentation um, if you want to see a couple photos from yesterday. Um, if I can get to that. And just while you're calling that up, Scott, um, Roland, from the code board's point of view, um, obviously a lot of these liens have piled up because of the, the penalties and such. Um, assuming, let's just say, uh, we do give the owner a year to bring it up to code and they are making progress satisfactory and, and whatnot, would the code board be willing to reduce some of those liens or where would what would that eventual cost be? Uh, Roland Du Bois Community Development Director, typically once a property is brought into compliance with the code board's order, in this case the code board's order is specific to exterior maintenance and securing of the structure. So the interior rebuild and such is not necessarily the subject of those orders, but typically what happens is once we get it to a certain uh, state of maintenance and a proposal to keep it that way, we bring it back to the code board. They'll typically reduce the, what we call the accrued flat fine mm -hmm. to something that's a more um, a handleable amount. Um, so the opportunity for the owner would be to go schedule a, a case back to the code board. They would consider reducing the fine. They also, on occasion, will do what's called a conditional setting of the fine where they'll say if you get it done within this time period, the fine will be set at this reduced amount for so that they know it's not hanging out there. So that's what we're going to recommend to the owner to address those uh, unresolved fines at this point. Okay, thank you. So yesterday's photos, you'll see that this is the back and it's still in a, in a condition. It was more overgrown. Um, but you can see the front and sides is basically open. Uh, they're keeping it mowed. Um, but it is the rare that if they could take care of that, I think they could eliminate a lot of their, their vandalization issues in, in uh, squatters and so forth that they've had. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, yes. Madam Chair, thank you. Yeah, I, I have a few things. One is, especially with the code enforcement liens, on this one, if, if we were going to go forward and it was going to be the property owner that was looking for reductions, I mean, I, I'd still be looking to get something. And the reason is because this property isn't the only one affected. I mean, this property is in a neighborhood with other residential units where this property has given a very negative impact to that neighborhood for years and devalued that, those areas. And there's a woman who may be speaking today that has been very patient over the last years of, of trying to push this forward and has basically been involved in buildings which have suffered for this for a good amount of time. And then when we go through some of Scott's presentation, you have, uh, it becomes more problematic. You've got a dissolved limited liability company and you've got pictures which show that it, this that property hasn't been attended to for some period of time. Most importantly, We've been dealing with this, the county's been dealing with this, and the people in the neighborhood have been dealing with this for 10 years, which makes me more hesitant on, on being generous to the property owner at this time, because there have been numerous code enforcement problems which have been addressed, but then dropped, basically. So it, it's never got back to where it should be over a 10 year period, and there's no great expectation of getting it back now. And the fact that the windows and doors and other things have been unpermitted work. So I, again, there's a, a slew of problems which just make me a little more skeptical at this point. So I, I still don't like to condemn properties and if there's a good chance of, of, of being addressing it, might support it, but I'd want very clear guidelines. And I'd also like to say, have something where we can you know, maybe go before court enforcement as soon as possible, come up with what it, that conditional fine might be have the conditional fine paid with the idea that if the work isn't done, it reverts back to the original fine. But I, I would like to see clear benchmarks in place that not just this board can rely on, but the neighborhood in which this property is situated can rely on. Because again, I think that this pro the, the neighborhood is, has 
been patient enough and put up with enough for long enough. So that's, those are my views. Okay. Yes. M Madam Chair, thank you. I defer Scott McAdam. I, uh, after, after looking at, looking at uh, some of the pictorial and, and hearing you, um, looking at a lot of new work that's been done there, you're confident that that, that new work can be brought into compliance and uh, permitted and carried through in an orderly fashion? The only real issue is the windows and doors. So yes, those can be brought in. The demolition, I mean, that had to be done anyway. So there's really no other work that was done out there. The roof was permitted back in 05. So it's just a shell down the studs, windows and doors unpermitted. That'd be an issue, but that's easy to look at. It appeared that there was new timber and some wiring had. No, that's all new. That's uh, vandals took a lot of that away and then they came in and demolished everything else. So those are the original studs. It's just all the drywall on the ceilings and walls have been removed. And then the vandals were stealing all the copper piping, the wire, the AC. Um, so a lot of that was demolished by the vandals, but the owner did go in there. Now it's just perfectly clean on the inside. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe there's some people from the public here that would like to speak on this. If so, come on up to the podium and state your name and address for the record. My name is Margaret Slay. I represent four of the properties up around 530 pla 530th place. Um, we took over our properties in 2016. Uh, there's 20 apartments there and we've significant, significantly invested in those properties to improve the location. It's 530, or excuse me, 550, 555, 575, and 535 13th place. Our problem is actually not vandals going in the back. The thickets were actually too thick for them to go in. It's the vandals just kicking the front doors. And especially as you get into the cold weather in January, What's going to happen if there's no plan to move forward? If there's nothing on the books of what they're going to do? Come January, if no one's on site, they're just going to kick in the doors and the windows because it's cold outside. And our problem is um, we've been doing this for several years of coming back to you that it's, it's a, a public nuisance to us. Um, we've had you know people on site. We have, uh, we have a, a we're on site probably two to three days a week, and we see vagrants and whatever going into the apartment. Um, so if we come, they come up with a plan to do it, our problem is that we're just gonna be back here next year making the same complaint. Um, so we're, we're a little hesitant. Uh, we, we would love the building to be occupied, for people to be there. It's better for us instead of a blank area um, it, of course, increases our values to our properties, but our problem is that we're worried we're just going to come back here next year and have the same complaint, that nothing will be done since it hasn't been done in the three and a half years that we've owned it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak on this? Yeah. Come on up to the podium and state your name and address for the record. I'm Maria De Los Santos and I'm the owner with my husband of 530 13th Place and my question to her is has once in the three and a half years they, have they ever called the police when they've seen the vagrants? No, neither them or any of the neighbors that are so disturbed by this have they ever bothered to call the police? Have they ever tried to intervene in any way? They have never bothered because there is no record in the sheriff's office of anybody calling the police other than us. And we have multiple, multiple calls. We even have a trespass warrant issued by the sheriff's office for this property, and no one has ever bothered to try on our behalf to reach out to the police if they're so bothered by it. But they're interested, and we keep getting calls and calls and calls from uh, owners of the um, surrounding properties. Oh, do you want to sell? The property's not worth anything. Why don't you sell it to us? So they have other interests other than just the aesthetics. Um, uh, but let me go back. Um, we, we owned that property for two years before the storms of 2000. Uh, first of all, I sent everyone a letter. I don't know if everybody got it, and multiple exhibits that I had to send in seven, seven different emails. <laughs> I'm 
sorry. It's okay. We have attempted, I don't know how many times, to secure the property. They were broken into. <laughs> the appliances were stolen. And everything happened because we had hurricane damage. The insurance company stayed from only gave us enough money for the roof and to patch repair the drywall. We did. A couple of years later, one of the tenants complained of a foul smell. We thought it was maybe a kid because we had water coming in through the windows and through the roof. And the pictures show it. We, we uh, cut out the parts that were um, damaged and we replaced that. We kept renting it for two more years. We never had a problem with code enforcement. One of the tenants com that had a small child complained that it smelled musty and wet. So we <coughs> let her out of the lease. We tore out the kitchen cabinets and there was black mold on the wall. So we asked everybody to move out for safety reasons. My husband and I are both nurse practitioners, so we didn't want anybody exposed. We filed a claim with the insurance company to reopen the claim. And we spent five years fighting with them because mold is excluded in the policy. And we said, but for the hurricane and the moisture, we wouldn't have mold. We hired an attorney, fought with them for five years. They still only gave us about $6,000, which wasn't enough. But anyway, that's uh, that resolved. In the interim, came a downturn in the economy. Even though we paid for grass every month, we paid our taxes. Our property got vandalized over and over and over. The ACs were stolen for the copper. The appliances were stolen. The copper wiring was stolen. The washers and dryers were stolen. Then we had vagrants come in. They totally trashed the place. We will come up, secure with plywood, and we will come back. And they haven't taken off. The doors will be kicked in. We'd put new deadbolts on. Then they would actually just break the frame of the door. We called the sheriff's office. And every time we came up here, we called the sheriff's office. Um, we were even told that some of the kids that were in the back um, were using it as uh, skateboarding. So I called the sheriff's office one time, went with the police officer to knock to figure out who it was, and that's when we did the trespass. Every time we had gotten a code enforcement violation, we came up and took care of it every single time. Now, the reason we have an LLC is because we have malpractice insurance, but we've always been advised any other properties other than your home, have them protected. Just in case, we've never been sued. We've been in practice for over 20 years, but just in case, have everything in an LLC. Mary Allo is the attorney that we use as a principal for the LLC. And if it's defunct, it's because I probably haven't renewed it, not because it's defunct. Um, because we have other properties in Indian River County that we have never had a problem with code enforcement. We maintain all our properties. Um, she moved two or three different times in the past few years and has had turnover of staff. So any letter that she received would come to us if she received it. Now, if something got to a secretary and they moved or the secretary didn't give it to her, I can't tell you. But every time that we were notified by her that she received something, we came up and we took care of it. We corrected it. Um, the last notice that we got that she got to us said we had 60 days. And then, of course, the way the property is, it's like, where do you even start? I mean, we're afraid to put in new windows because the windows are expensive. We just spent $10,000 between windows and doors. So we put in the windows. What if somebody comes and steals the windows? So you're between a rock and a hard place. But we were given 60 days to start to correct the problem and make it safe. So we said, well, let's put the windows and the doors at least. We didn't want to put the sliders because the rear was still overgrown, even though we paid the, the lawn man. But the rear had fencing, wood fences, individual wood fences, and we decided that we'd rather tear down those fences before we put the sliders in because otherwise it's just an open opportunity for somebody to be there just breaking it you know, all night without uh, being seen. So we changed everything but the rear sliders that are still boarded up, and we've been in the process of tearing down all the wood fencing and pruning back all the, all the ficus trees so it's visible uh, from the street. We actually also put solar lighting, so there's some, even though we do have two street lights, but some additional lighting on the, on the house, um, on the property. 
um, but we ask that you give us a timeline that we need to correct this, and we do ask that, um, although you would like us to have some fines, um, as I said before, every single notice that we got from code enforcement, we addressed and we corrected it timely. Um, if there were other notices that went out that we didn't receive, we didn't receive them, but every time we came up, we saw the property and that was open and unsafe, we secured it. We cannot be here 24 seven to correct, you know, we could have secured it today and two days later it was broken into again, but we're not here. Um, and again, I have the calls to the sheriff's office. I have a, a, the, trespass, the trespass sign that was uh, posted. Uh, we've done everything that we can to protect the property. And although the neighbors again may be upset, they never bothered to you know, look out for the property on our behalf, call the sheriff's office on our behalf. Nobody ever bothered. Nobody ever bothered to tell their kids, don't go over there and don't throw, wind don't throw rocks out the windows to break them. Because a lot of that stuff, besides the vagrants, was local residents that were living right there and their kids. I don't, I don't think getting into tit for tat with your neighbors is gonna help us here this morning. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you this. Do you and your husband have the financial means to be able to, in a timely fashion, make the repairs and bring the property into compliance? And we heard our building official estimated that might be somewhere in the $200,000 range. In the exhibits that I sent you, there is an estimate that I had gotten a year ago for $95,000 to do the major repairs. And we did all the demo ourselves interior, getting rid of all the drywall because the drywall, did, there still were some patches of mold and it was all torn, so uh, we- Again, the question is, do you and your husband have the financial means that if we give you an outline, uh, a map, so to speak, of, of timelines and conditions, are you and your husband financially going to be able to meet that schedule? Yes, the property as it is cannot, if the property was in a condition that we could ask for a loan, we would have, but no bank will give us a loan for that property. So we got an equity loan on our home to try to, repair this property and my husband's willing to pull out money from his 401k. Okay. Um, so Madam Chair, what I'd like to propose to the board is that we um, ask Roland to put um, Mrs. Santos case before the code board with the assumption she will follow the schedule that Scott will provide as far as pulling permits and satisfactory progress on those permits and that we would ask the board to consider a conditional fine and that uh, Ms. Santos would need to pay that fine in short order to keep moving this forward and then we would grant her a reasonable amount of time to make the repairs given that you are coming in pulling the permits getting inspections and, and showing progress to the satisfaction of our uh, building official. I would need to know what that fine is because if the fine is going to be something in the thousands. Well, that's, thousands. that's why we're going to do that as soon as we can so you know going forward what that is. Madam Chair, I'll second that. Okay. I, I'm a little bit confused. Um, I mean, the item before us today is about the demolition item. Yes. And the motion was focused on the code board process. Well, mm -hmm. the, so the motion would be to okay. table the demolition. Um, at least for a month until the code board can give us a ruling and Mrs. Santos can look at what that fine might be and then make her final decision, go, no, go. If I may, yep. I, mean, I think we've gone in the past, gone ahead and approved the condemnation, but then basically agreed to stay it because it takes some time to, to go through the, the process of getting the building torn down. How long about, Scott? usually 60 days okay he's go off a bid and exactly so I mean that's a 60 day time period so I mean I'd feel much better if we went ahead and approved the condemnation subject to the idea of it being stayed if a plan everything you said Commissioner O'Brien a plan is in place uh, that the good faith efforts are being made to go ahead with it and the staff is satisfied that enough progress is being made that the property is the first things that have to be done with the property to make the neighborhood safe are done and then that when the code enforcement board comes back with a number that within another 30 days of that 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 fine is paid those 
type of thing. I, th I feel much better with that, and it's consistent with what we've done in the past. I, I would rather table it and um, go with Commissioner O'Brien's suggestion based on the fact that staff has said at the end of their presentation that the demolition, that the building is actually in decent shape. It has good bones. There's been some progress made, and it's not necessarily conducive to the neighborhood to have a vacant lot there. I understand your concerns that this has been going on for some time, but I would prefer to table and let this move through um, code enforcement and the building department to set up a specific timeline, then bring that back and, and go from there. Madam Chair, yes. yes. And, and that's why I so seconded the motion. Uh, uh, I, I agree. Uh, customarily, when we have the 11th hour, I'm going to fix it. It's going to be corrected. Uh, we were talking about that yesterday. It very, very rarely, because if it has ever occurred, because the building is in so uh, buildings are in so disrepair that they need to be mitigated and taken down. In this case, it 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 appears that you have a lot of fresh work within the building and it, it, it appears that uh, you've been left vulnerable because you haven't completed the perimeter uh, to the fullest extent. You might have been a little short a few times. You know, you can stack straw so far, uh, it's still not wind resistant. Uh, and the same thing with the locks and the doors and the lighting. And if the building doesn't have electricity, then you don't have a perimeter control. Uh, th there's a lot of application that could be done to cut this uh, uh, short and, and make this happen positively for you all. The challenge is that it takes a lot of funding. And you have to be willing to, and if you're stating that you have the funding to move forward rather quickly, and deal with the code enforcement issues and deal with the building issues and all the permitting and get the job done quickly, you have a better chance. But if you don't, if it's going to take you that year, you're absolutely right. You're going to be back again. You're going to be calling the sheriff's office and you're going to be patching and plywooding because it's just a matter of time. You leave yourself vulnerable with the, the amount of work you're being done, if you're doing the windows yourself, you put one window at a time. Well, the windows are in. All the windows and doors are in except for the sliders because we wanted to clear the rear of any, so have good visibility when we install the sliders. So you have some openings. They're all closed. They're all boarded. Boarded or? Double boarded, but only the sliders, only the, the sliding doors. That's it. Everything else has new windows. So then you, you, you have a fighting chance. But you, you need to act progressively and, and swiftly because if you don't, you're only going to be back in the vulnerability quarter again and uh, right back to challenges. And uh, we, we would regret uh, the decision, I think, that's uh, about to be made. So Madam Chair, just yes. Roland, if we table this to February 18th, would that give code board time enough to have a meeting and the next next code enforcement board meeting is the fourth Monday in January so I believe that's the 27th of January so that's when we'll schedule it okay so madam chair I'll just amend my motion and say whether we table this until Tuesday February 18th okay second so amended all right so we have a motion by Commissioner O'Brien and a second by Commissioner Flesher any further discussion all in favor aye, aye. opposed aye the motion passes four to one with Commissioner Solari dissenting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next item is Public Works, Sector 5, Beach and Dune Restoration Project. Rich, welcome. Commissioner Rich Berka, Public Works Director. What we have today is uh, Sector 5, Beach Renourishment Project. Uh, back in September of 2019, the board awarded Rio Bach a $4.5 million project to do beach restoration on Sector 5. Um, while the project was out to bid, the, we had Hurricane Dorian. Now, while the hurricane stayed off the coast, 
it impacted the beaches all up and down the coastline. We estimated back when this, the Riobot project came to the board, we estimated about 50,000 cubic yards of sand was uh, taken off the beaches in Sector 5. We went back and with our consultant, we did some surveying and some mapping and we determined that it was about 61,000 cubic yards or about 83,000 tons of sand that had been removed from the beach uh, during the Hurricane Dorian event. In order to replace that sand as part of the Sector 5 project, um, we asked the contractor to give us a price in order to replace the, that sand. He came back to us with a cost of $22.18 uh, per ton, which is about 58 cents more than a contract price. Um, we analyzed this and we agree with this as we can't extend the contract time, so he has to bring on additional equipment and people to meet the deadline which of the original contract because of turtle season. Um, there was also some uh, bonding costs associated with the, pro with the uh, additional work. So the county got a proposal from, county staff got a proposal from Maria Bach in, if, in the magnitude of $1,879,000 and some change to restore the 83,000 tons of sand that was removed by Hurricane Dorian. Funding is available through a budget amendment uh, for the $1.879 million um, from the Beach Restoration Fund cast forward of October 1st. The county is going to move forward. We were in the declared as a disaster and we are going to move forward with FEMA for reimbursement of some of the sand, basically a 75% federal match. 12.5% uh, state match and a local match of 12.5%. At this point in time, this process has barely begun uh, with FEMA, uh, but we wanna make sure as the project is moving forward, we can't not replace the Dorian sand because it, it's just not, you can't construct it because Dorian sand came out last. So you have to put that back first. You can't leave that sand missing. So we're moving forward with replacing the the, the beach to it, the template that we were permitted, which includes replacing the Dorian sand. <clears throat> um, in order to do that, to do the complete project, we've got two alternatives for the board to consider. Alternative one is to authorize additional funding for change order one in the amount of $1,879,240, uh, producing a new total price of $6,390,952 for Riobot. Um, additionally, authorizing the chair to execute the change order number one on behalf of the county. Alternative two is to not deny the change order and continue the project with the original quantities. This alternative may impact reimbursement from DEP and FEMA for not filling the sand to the original template. This alternative will end the current project at whatever location the original quantities of sand are exhausted, leaving a remaining portion of Sector 5 in its current condition. The current permit would need to be amended to reflect the final ending location. After the agenda was posted, we have a additional information that uh, the budget director was able to get from FEMA. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, that if we do not move forward with replacing the sand, we could be in violation and lose our Matthew and Irma funding. And it would also jeopardize us for ever getting reimbursement in the future. So I wanted to make sure you guys understood that, that this was new information that came in late Friday afternoon. And I'm concerned. I just want to bring that to your information for your attention because we are not able to put that in the agenda in the staff report. And Kristen Daniels is here if, she, if uh, you have any questions for her on that. Staff recommends alternative number one. The board authorizes additional funding for change order number one in the amount of $1,879,240.02, producing a new total contract amount of $6,390,952.02. Additionally, staff recommends the board authorize the chairman to execute change order number one on behalf of the county. Thank you. Commissioner Solari. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I just want to see if I got some of these things straight. 
So what you're asking for today is another roughly $1.9 million to go ahead and fill the template for the sand for the beach in Sector 5. Yes, sir. But because, as I understand it, we haven't filed all the, or FEMA hasn't done all the work, or we haven't done all the work with the work papers for FEMA, we don't know that we'd get reimbursed for all of that $1.9 million. That's correct. Okay. It's which just want to make clear. And how do we pay for that $1 million if we're not reimbursed by it? The funding, in my understanding, the funding comes out of the local tourist tax. Jason? Okay, so it's, it's tourist tax dollars that's, that's going to pay for that, which is yes. appropriate because uh, I think the, for me, the beach is very important for tourism in the, in the community. But this is located in the city of Rio Beach. Yes, sir. Okay, but how can that be that we're putting maybe $1.9 million at risk if some of the f people from the city of Vero Beach say that we never use tourist tax dollars for the city of Vero Beach. But you're probably not the one to answer that question. I just, you can understand my confusion though, because we continue to put millions and millions of dollars into the city of Vero Beach, but then be are accused by the people, some of the council members of the city of Vero Beach for not putting tourist dollars into the city of Vero Beach. I, I, I'm flummoxed. Uh, I'll have to ask them though how they actually work through that logically because I've tried for about a million and a half, but I've gotten nowhere, so I apologize for that. So, I mean, I understand that we would put this $1.9 million at risk, but the $1.9 million does come from tourist tax dollars, which are appropriately, in my view, used for this. So I'm very comfortable for this, and I'd be happy to move that recommendation. And I would be happy to second that, and thank you for summing up my um, thoughts as well. I, I, with the added, a, added chores that you had as, as chairing this meeting, Madam Chair, I'm happy to take some of the blame. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Madam Chair. Yes, <laughs> please. I Ryan. just didn't know if you wanted to consider alternative three, which is in my mind since Vero Beach City Council Member Graves has asked the city attorney to look into um, the tourist tax. Maybe this is a good opportunity just to turn this entire project over to the city of Vero Beach. Well, and then they can hire a coastal engineer and they can do the permit and they can apply to FEMA and they, you know, if they want this, I think we should give it to them. Well, and they can do my own self-interest as a member of the city of Vero, as a resident of the city of Vero Beach for a long time uh, kicks in. Things like the county years ago gave the city of Vero Beach the opportunity to do Aviation Boulevard, which went exactly no inches in the time the city of Vero Beach had the ability to, to push that project through. And as I live just two blocks from the beach, again, my own self-interest kicks in. Yesterday on my walk, I walked up to Humberston Park, looked over the beach, I enjoyed it. I would like to continue to have those same views going forward. And at this point, the only way I see us having the, us meaning the, the citizens of the city of Vero Beach, having the same opportunity to look at the beach at the beaches of the city of Vero Beach is to allow the county to take care of the beach in the city of Vero Beach. Ah, very good point, Commissioner. Thank you. Happy to help. We have a conversation about the conversation. Commissioner Bryan, I, I, I'm just concerned that uh, in the inclusion of the, of the argument for option three would be the uh, addition of a $200,000 lifeguard station and that might push this over budget, and then we will now sacrifice our funding. So I, I don't know if that's really an option. Okay. Well, I, I, I I've, mean, heard, I, I've heard convincing arguments not to go with uh, alternative three, so I'll, I'll pull any, any discussion of that out now. But a valiant argument. Yes. J Jason, did you, have, did you have something to add to this? Oh, no, I'll yeah. just say I, I, I hear the, the the county commission's concern and, and, and understand that in, in the confusion there. Um, and I, I think alternative one is, is the right, uh, right way to go. Um, and we're happy to, as, as Commissioner Solari said, the county's happy to provide uh, these services for the benefit of the city of Vero and, and the rest of the county residents as well. And and just, I, is, is there any way we can amend the motion to work in the death train in this at any point? I just think the more, Frequently, we mention death train, the better. So well, if you well, want to I, I, amend again, your motion. I don't think you stand this, all the tracks. No, the real problem with that is this has to do with the city of Vero Beach, which has done almost nothing against the death train since go, it yeah. started. Yep. So I'd rather not involve something else they've done nothing about in an issue about which they've done nothing in their charter. So I, I don't think that helps clear anything I up think at all. We're all on the same page, but just to bring this back to the item that we're you on. Read it now? Yes, yes, there is a motion by Commissioner Solari, and the second by Commissioner Adams. <laughs> for alternative one, a staff recommendation. Is there any more discussion? Anybody How from the public? I know, really, I think we've hit it all. But anybody from the public <laughs> wish to 
speak on this or anything that might somehow relate to this tangentially? <laughs> Seeing all none, all right, favor. all in favor? Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries. And with that, we will take a five minute break. Oh, we need it. Since I have lost control. <laughs>
here. For the encouragement. Thank you for being my support at the crisis. Well, <laughs> you're our, our <laughs> back to order. Next item on our agenda is Commissioner's Open Dialogue. My favorite. We'll start down here with Commissioner Zork. Well, thank you. Uh, turn back on here. Thank you, Madam Chair. And a early, well, we still have one more meeting before Christmas, right? We do. Oh, we do. So we'll save that for a later date. Um, as I mentioned at our, this discussion item um, last time about the uh, great news about Bethel Creek being considered in the funding consideration. Uh, I've been speaking with some folks about bringing some some people from FIT down to do a, a closer community informational update program with that. So as soon as I get the dates worked out, we'll look forward to seeing a, a agenda item announcing that information when FIT staff is available to come down and share with the community how this whole process evaluation is going to work. Um, you know, there's just a lot of great things going on in our community uh, with the great parade on Saturday night for those of you who made it. And um, I'm just going to be thankful and be short today and stop there. Oh, we're That's thankful fantastic. too. <laughs> Commissioner Flesher. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm very thankful uh, for, for a lot of things. And, and I, I want to just point out a couple. We had a very busy weekend with parades and activities. But uh, one thing that was very cherished was the, uh, uh, the Pearl Harbor uh, commemorative that, that occurred in Sebastian. Uh, and during that time, I reflected, you know, we realized that uh, there was an event in, in September 11th, 2001, and uh, which I was directly impacted, but some have not been impacted or have quickly, because we've had a whole generation grow from that point, that many don't understand what had happened. And the reason why I bring that up is because we weren't around for, none of us were around for the event of Pearl Harbor. And we had the benefit of having one, uh, Arnie Schwickenberg, a survivor of the uh, uh, Pearl Harbor event. Um, It brought us closer to understanding, and I have a fear that uh, the, the future generations will not. So I just want to thank the, the, the all the veterans for putting on uh, such an event as a uh, reminder of such a tragic event that occurred here in the United States, and uh, I and I I, um, I hope that it continues because we have something great here. And we have a great veterans group that uh, won't let us forget. As we say, we, we won't forget. And, uh, and I want to thank them for what they've done for us during their active service. But m more importantly is uh, here on the home front because we need it. Uh, second thing is uh, in uh, traveling the county, I don't know if you all have noticed, but a lot of folks are putting some effort into their residents, their businesses, and I, I think there's less code enforcement cases. And uh, I'm grateful that uh, we have the economy we have where people are freeing up some dollars and, and making this a better place because it really is starting to show. I don't know if uh, any of you have uh, uh, had the same feeling, but things look fresher, uh, there's new coats of paint, there's new driveways being put in, uh, there's uh, people are fixing up what they own and what they have and making this a better place and making it a more valued uh, county. So I just wanted to thank everybody for being good stewards of their own properties and uh, others as well. And I'm sure Roland appreciates that uh, in the code enforcement area as well. Most definitely. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioner O'Brien. Um, the only thing I have, uh, Madam Chair, is last month the Ford Association of Counties um, completed their policy conference, and all of you should have gotten a packet with the final um, adopted uh, policy statement. So that'll be what 
fact staff will be working on as we go through legislative session. And uh, we do have two events coming up. One is the uh, Research Coast, which is kind of sponsored by our chambers, Martin, St. Louis, and Indian River. They'll be having their legislative day, and then I believe the FAC legislative day will be the week after that. And I believe those are Jan or February dates, January dates. February I think. Dates. Yeah. So those are coming up, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Solari. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit about an issue that we talked about on this day. It's just a week or so, two ago, and it's about the bulk wastewater agreement. Mm -hmm. Given that the City of Vero Beach's meeting was the same time our meeting was last Tuesday, you may have missed it, but last Tuesday the City of Vero Beach Council did discuss our motion regarding a possible bulk wastewater agreement between the county and the city, which would obviate the need for the city to build a new plant. The city manager addressed the points of our motion one at a time. First, that the agreement should do no harm to existing county customers. The city manager said that this was good to do. The second one, that the city pay for the cost of the piping from the city to our plant. He said, and again, I quote, I would agree with that. <clears throat> the third, that the city pay for any county capacity that is required. He had no comment. But the fourth was that the city release all non-city customers. This appeared to be a, the sticking point. Evidently, without the fourth point, further discussion was warranted, but the discussion that the council had made it clear that the council does not want to give up the money provided by the outside customers. Mary Young said that this was a home rule issue. Council Member Graves said that the utility provides about a million and a half <coughs> into our general fund, and for some strange reason, the city needs the utility to keep Vero Vero, which I simply didn't under quite understand that one. He noted that today the city and county have comparable rates, but he failed to mention how the rates would compare after the utility paid roughly $54 million or so for the new plant. The only person who even mentioned the customers that the utility serves and who seemed to have an open mind was Council Member Brackett. As a citizen of the city of Vero Beach, I thank him for that. No one bothered to ask the question, which would result in cheaper rates? the city building its own plant or consolidation with the county? The, prob the question was probably not asked because most probably the answer is pretty obvious to everyone. Incredibly, Council Member Graves could say, we run our utility well, but never mention the elephant in the room that perhaps tens of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance or that the DEP report would said that the water system is in pitiful condition. Yet, he's confident that we run our utility well. Unfortunately, it appears that the council is so enamored by the flow of funds from the utility into the city's general fund that it has failed to learn any lessons from the ci city of Vero Beach Electric to FPNL. As a citizen of the city of Vero Beach, I'm sad that the council still thinks more of the city government than it does of its customers who are citizens of the city and county. As an Indian River County Commissioner, I am proud that our utility continues to be run for the benefit of its customers providing its services at the lowest possible price consistent with a well-run system. Listening to the City Council made me think that its members have totally forgotten both the meaning of home rule and how upset people were about the city's taxation without representation. So, considers, considering the outside customers of the city who continue to be taxed without representation, I will finish this mini diatribe with the fifth of the Virginia Resolves on the Stamp Act of May 30th, 1765, presented by Patrick Henry to the General Assembly of the Colony of Virginia. Resolved that the General Assembly of this colony have the only and exclusive right and power to lay taxes and impositions upon the inhabitants of this colony, and that every attempt to vest such power in any person or persons whatsoever other than the General Assembly aforesaid has a manifest tendency to destroy British as well as American freedom. But I'd like to end this discussion on a more positive note, so I will uh, today say Merry Christmas. But <laughs> I, I want to assure everybody that in today's politically polarized world, not, where not even a, a well-intentioned holiday, holiday greeting is a simple thing, so along with the greeting, I'd like to say just a few words. Please know that when I wish you a Merry Christmas, I am not trying to impose some holiday hegemony on you. 
For Jackie and me, the Christmas season is a joyous time, and we are happier and more joyous than ever during this time. When Jackie or I say Merry Christmas, we are simply inviting you to share some of our joy with us. And if you happen to see us and say Happy Hanukkah or Happy Kwanzaa to us, that's how we'll take it, as a simple offer to share something with you that is special and important in your life. So to each and every one of you out there, hopefully more of you out there in the television audience that are out, than are out here in, the, in the, this chamber today, please accept our help, heartfelt best wishes for a very Merry Christmas. Madam Chairman, back to you. Thank you. <coughs> Does that mean we're all invited for dinner, Jackie cooking? Ooh, only well, that merry part. Cookies. Yeah, that's the true Christmas spirit. <laughs> all right, so my turn. <laughs> in keeping with the Christmas spirit, um, I just want to say that Santa is arriving in Felsmere tonight, and in true Felsmere fashion, he will be arriving via airboat. So anybody <laughs> that wants to come on out, it's the place to be this evening. Um, also on Friday, the Sebastian had their light up night and that was a great way to get out yes. and see the businesses, um, have some good food and see some awesome Christmas lights. So it's really nice to see the community so festive this time of year. Uh, I would like to thank um, Public Works. Uh, the paving in Felsmere is complete. I know we're still working on some of the traffic lights, but the paving is done. It looks beautiful. I know it was a long process and I appreciate um, everybody's hard work on that. And then also I want to thank staff that provided some information to the Vera Lake Estates MSTU Advisory Committee. They did speak to um, the Vera Lake Estates Property Owners Group last month um, just to give them an update on how that MSTU process works and what they do and the projects that are going on. And it was a really good meeting. A lot of good information was provided to the community and I appreciate staff taking the time to um, advise that group on on what was going on so and with that I also would echo Commissioner Solari's heartfelt Merry Christmas and holiday wishes mm. and we will move on to the solid waste disposal district madam, madam chair, chair. I'd like to move approval of the minutes of July 17 September 11 September 18 and August 13 2019 all right, we have a motion by Commissioner um, O'Brien and a second by Commissioner Solari on all the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is uh, work order number 28 to Kimley Horn for the Solid Waste Disposal District Annual Financial Reports. Move approval. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Solari. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The next item is work order number six to Geosyntec for engineering services. Madam Chair, move approval. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Zork. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And with that, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, we stand adjourned.